Welcome back, everyone, to the deep dive. You know, today we are going to look at some uh, really interesting ideas about the human brain and technology. Like, have you ever heard of remote neural monitoring? Right. Or uh, how about this electronic brain link technology? <sighs> yeah. They sound like they're straight out of some sci fi movie, don't they? Yeah, it's like, whoa, that's out there. But um, those are what we're diving into today. Yeah, that's what we're going to be exploring today, these concepts. We'll try to figure out what's science, what's maybe speculation, all that good stuff. Exactly. Our main source this time is a lawsuit that was filed back in 1992 by this guy, John St. Clair Akwe. Okay. And um, he filed this lawsuit against the NSA. He makes some well, pretty extraordinary claims. Yeah. Before we jump into the lawsuit itself, I think um, it's important to kind of set the stage a little bit to to understand the claims about remote neural monitoring. Got to understand how our brains work, right? <laughs> so our brains, they operate on electrical impulses, like every thought, every sensation, every every action, all that stuff generates tiny electrical signals. So our brains are basically like little electrical circuits or something like that. Kind of. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. And these electrical signals, right, they generate these incredibly weak electromagnetic fields. Okay. And you can actually detect these with sensitive equipment. Mm -hmm. So imagine being able to detect those and then interpret those signals from a distance. Okay. That's that's kind of the basic idea behind um, remote neural monitoring. So essentially reading someone's mind remotely. Yeah. It's fascinating and also a little like unsettling. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's just one aspect of it, right? It's not just reading, but also maybe the possibility of influencing brain activity remotely. Wait, so you're saying like someone could control someone else's thoughts or yeah. their actions just by manipulating their brain waves. That's the claim, at least according to some of these theories. Wow. Okay. So, let's let's get back to this John St. Clair Aqua, this lawsuit. So, Yeah. He claims he's got firsthand knowledge of the NSA, how it's structured, how it operates, mm. especially in these areas like signals intelligence, they call it SIGINT, mm -hmm. and domestic intelligence or DOMINT. Gotcha. And so he's claiming the NSA is using this RNM technology for surveillance. That's one of the central allegations, yeah. Mm. He's saying they they have this advanced technology that can detect and decode the electromagnetic waves from the human body. Okay. So essentially eavesdropping on people's thoughts and emotions. So this guy's saying they can basically read your mind. Like, he really goes so far as to say he was personally targeted by uh, by a group at the NSA using this. Oh, oh, oh. Calls them the Kinnicum Group. And he claims they were using yeah. this R&M, sending 3D sound directly to his brain, like, to create a super disturbing experience. Oh, wow. That'd be wild, wouldn't it? Yeah, his description's are really vivid, yeah. Uh, and unsettling. He provides a lot of detail, you know, about how he believes this technology works. So, for instance... Um, he talks about this concept called evoked potentials. Evoked potentials. What are those? So think of evoked potentials like unique brainwave signatures okay. that are triggered by different thoughts or sensations. Yeah. So if you think about, I don't know, a specific image, right? Or you remember a particular sound, uh -huh. it would create a distinct pattern of electrical activity in your brain. Got it. And Arcway is claiming the NSA... Uh, can not only detect these evoked potentials, but also maybe m manipulate them using specific frequencies. So it's like they're using a specific frequency to like trigger a specific thought in someone's brain. Like it's yeah. like one of those like a remote control for the mind. Yeah, that's that's what he suggests. Yeah. Wow. He even provides this uh, this detailed table in his lawsuit yeah. to outline how different brain areas could be targeted with specific frequencies to induce various effects from like motor control to auditory and visual hallucinations, even like imposing subconscious thoughts. Oh, wow. Okay, but how? How does he claim they can target such specific areas of the brain? So he explains that different areas of the brain operate on different frequencies. Okay. So uh, like, for example, the motor cortex, right, which controls movement, uh -huh. might be more susceptible to stimulation at one frequency. Right. Whereas uh, the visual cortex, which processes visual information, might be more sensitive to a different frequency. Okay. So according to Akwe, the NSA, like, they've mapped out these frequencies, uh -huh. allowing them to target very specific brain functions. It's a pretty wild concept. Yeah. But even if the science is there, right? Yeah. The ethical implications are, are huge, right? Mm -hmm. Someone could actually control another person's thoughts, their actions. Yeah. Just by manipulating their brain waves. That, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a serious violation. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the potential for misuse is enormous. Like, imagine this technology in the wrong hands. 
you know, it could be used for all sorts of like really nefarious purposes, like mind control, psychological torture, all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, the chilling thought. Um, so, okay, Akwe's lawsuit, it mainly focuses on this remote neural monitoring, but he also mentions another technology called voice to skill. They, I guess they shortened it to V2K. V2K, yeah. Um, what is that? So imagine being able to transmit sound directly into someone's head oh, yeah. without them wearing any kind of receiver. Oh, wow. No headphones, no speakers, just like sound beamed straight to your brain. That sounds that sounds like straight out of a movie. How is that supposed to work? The exact mechanisms, I don't know. But the idea is that uh, by using specific electromagnetic frequencies, you might be able to stimulate the auditory cortex, yeah. creating the perception of sound within the brain. So it's like bypassing the ears altogether and sending the sound straight yeah. to the part of the brain that processes the sound. Right. That's that's the general concept. Yeah. And just like with RNM, V2K has all sorts of potential applications, ranging from, you know, kind of benign to pretty sinister. Yeah. You know, like imagine being able to communicate silently with someone in a crowded room. Okay. But then also imagine being bombarded with like harassing voices that no one else can hear. Wow, that would be incredibly disorienting. Yeah. I mean, it makes you wonder if there's any truth to these stories you hear about uh, like targeted individuals. Yeah. You know, suffering from electronic harassment. Right. Yeah, it's definitely a disturbing thought, no doubt. Um, and it brings up, you know, all sorts of questions about the potential misuse of these technologies and the lack of uh, any real legal frameworks to protect people from these kind of intrusions. Okay, so we've covered a lot here. Remote neural monitoring, voice to skull technology, all the claims made by John St. Clair Aque. But how much of this is actually, you know, possible? Like, is there any scientific basis to any of these claims? Yeah, that's that's what we're going to be looking at next. While Aque's claims are definitely intriguing, I think we got to look at them through the lens of what we currently understand about science. So let's let's dive into the world of brain computer interfaces, see what's actually possible right now in the real world. OK. Sounds good. I'm ready to try to separate uh, the facts from the fiction here. Let's do it. Okay, so we just heard all about John St. Clair, Akwe, what he's okay. saying about the NSA and R&M and all that, right? Uh -huh. But um, now it's time to kind of step back a little. Right. Look at what, what science actually says about this stuff. Yeah. So, like, what's the reality when it comes to these brain-computer interfaces today? So it's really important to realize that this whole field of brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs as they're called, okay. it's it's changing so fast. Right. It's really evolving rapidly. And stuff that used to be like pure science fiction right. is, is now like it's becoming reality. Although maybe not in the same way as some of the more um, sensational claims that you hear. So you're saying mind control might still be fantasy. Yeah, pretty much. But like... Are there real world applications for BCIs like happening right now? Oh yeah, absolutely. And some of them are like really remarkable. Okay. For example, um, there are BCIs being used to help people with paralysis. Okay. Regain control of their limbs. Oh wow. So, so they implant these tiny little electrodes in the brain's motor cortex. Mm -hmm. And then researchers, they can decode the neural signals that, that control movement okay and then they can translate those into commands for like prosthetic limbs so someone who's lost the use of their arm or leg could actually control a robotic arm yeah. or leg just by thinking about it exactly yeah and the level of control that they're getting now is amazing like yeah. there are cases where people are grasping objects writing their names even playing video games really using using the bci that's yeah. incredible yeah it's like right out of a movie but it's it's real and it's not just about like restoring lost function either. Okay. BCIs are also being used to help people with uh, locked-in syndrome communicate. Locked-in syndrome, what's that? So people with this condition, they're fully conscious, I but they know. can't move or speak. I it's because of paralysis. And so BCIs can give them a way to communicate oh. by detecting their brain activity. Oh, okay, I see. So they can think about the words or letters they want to say. Uh -huh. And the BCI will translate those thoughts uh, maybe into text or even like into speech. Oh, wow. That's that's really amazing. It really shows you 
like how how powerful this technology could be. Yeah, for sure. But I got to ask, how does this connect back to what Akwe was talking about? Right. He was talking about remote monitoring and manipulating brain activity mm. without any kind of like implant or physical connection. Right. Is that even possible with today's technology? Okay, so that's where things get kind of complicated. Okay. While the, the BCIs we've talked about so far rely on implanted electrodes to detect the brain activity, mm. there are non-invasive methods of brain imaging okay. that can be used too. So there are techniques like uh, electroencephalography or EEG EG. and magnetoencephalography or MEG. Oh, yeah. And these can detect brain waves from outside the skull. But the signals that they pick up are much weaker okay. and much less precise Got it. than what you would get through implanted electrodes. So while you might be able to detect like some brain activity remotely, the level of detail and control that Akwe was talking about, right. like being able to read specific thoughts mm -hmm. or manipulate emotions using like precise frequencies, right. that's still a long way off, if it's even possible at all. Yeah, that's kind of the consensus among most neuroscientists. I mean, I... the brain is just, it's so incredibly complex. Wow. And our understanding of how it works is still pretty limited. Mm -hmm. And while there have been some interesting studies, you know, using EEG and MEG to decode certain brain states, like recognizing simple images maybe or words that a person is thinking about right we're nowhere near the level of of sophistication where we could like remotely control someone's thoughts or their actions yeah that makes sense it's kind of <laughs> like if you're trying to listen to a conversation in a crowded room right but you're across the street yeah you might be able to hear like snippets of sound but you wouldn't be able to understand the whole conversation right yeah. Or influence what people are saying. Exactly. Yeah. It's a good analogy. Okay. The brain is always generating this this symphony of electrical activity uh -huh. and trying to isolate specific signals right. related to like individual thoughts or intentions. Yeah. It's really, really challenging, even with implanted electrodes, let alone like from a distance. So the concept of remote neural monitoring, while it's a really interesting idea, yeah. the technology as Aqua describes it. Right. It's it's just not there yet. Yeah, for now it's still science fiction. But it's important to keep in mind technology changes so fast what seems impossible today oh, right. might be commonplace tomorrow, you just never know. Yeah. But it's crucial that as these technologies advance, we got to be really careful right. and really think about the ethical implications. Absolutely. So, okay, we've talked about remote neural monitoring, we've explored the current state of BCIs, mm -hmm. brain computer interfaces. What about that other technology Aqua mentioned, electronic brain link, right, or EBL? Uh huh. Like, is is brain to brain communication something like telepathy? Yeah. Is that actually a possibility? Okay, so this is where things get really interesting. Well, full fledged telepathy, like you know, where you can read someone's thoughts directly. Yeah. No devices or anything. Yeah. That's still science fiction. Yeah. But researchers, they are exploring some. Well, some pretty mind-blowing possibilities right. when it comes to brain-to-brain um, -brain communication. Okay, so no Professor X just yet. Yeah. But, but you're saying there are, like, actual experiments. Yeah. With with connecting brains. There have been some fascinating studies, yeah. Wow. Where researchers have, they've actually transmitted information okay. directly from one brain to another. Really? Albeit in, in pretty limited and controlled ways. So how does that even work? So in one experiment, yeah. they used EEG, right? Uh-huh. To record brain activity from a person who was thinking about moving their hand. Okay. And then they transmitted those signals to another person's brain using um, transcranial magnetic stimulation oh. or TMS. TMS, okay. And get this, the second person's hand actually twitched. What? In response to the first person's thoughts. Wow. So they basically like bypassed all the normal stuff, like the nerves and the muscles, yeah. and just sent the uh, the intention to move like straight from one brain to the other. That's basically it, yeah. That is incredible. And it's not just simple movements either. Oh, other yeah. studies, they've explored transmitting more complex information. Like what? Like visual images or even emotions. Wait, so you're saying they've transmitted like feelings from one person to another? Well, it's it's very early research and uh, yeah. we don't really fully understand how it works, but yeah. it seems like by stimulating certain parts of the brain right. that are associated with certain emotions, 
researchers can induce kind of a corresponding feeling in the in the recipient. That's wild. Yeah. It's it's fascinating but also a little creepy, you know. <laughs> like imagine the possibilities. Yeah. But also the potential for like manipulation. Absolutely. With any technology, especially something this powerful, yeah. you've got potential benefits and risks. Right. I mean, imagine sharing knowledge directly or experiences with another person okay. or, or providing like emotional support to someone just through thought. Yeah. I mean, those are pretty incredible possibilities. But, you know, on the other hand, there's there's the potential for like invasion of privacy, yeah. unwanted influence, maybe even, you know, thought control. We really need to be careful and think about the ethics as this technology develops. Yeah, for sure. So we started with John Sinclair Ankwe and his claims about the NSA. Uh -huh. And um, we went into like the realities of brain computer interfaces today. Yeah. And now we're talking about the possibility of brain-to-brain uh, -brain communication. Right. It seems like we're like right on the edge of this this technological revolution, something that could totally change how we relate to, well, our own minds and each other. I totally agree. I think as we go forward, you know, it's really important to talk about these technologies yeah. openly, you know, and in a way that everyone can understand. We need to be talking about the potential benefits, but also the risks. For sure. And we need to set some clear ethical guidelines, you know, mm. and st strong regulations. We need to make sure that the development and use of these tools, uh, you know, is transparent and accountable. Absolutely. So to everyone listening out there, we encourage you, like, keep exploring this stuff. Yeah, for sure. It's it's a fascinating topic. Absolutely. Um, do your own research. Ask questions. Yeah. And don't be afraid to to challenge what you hear. Yeah. Think critically. Yeah, because the future of our minds is literally at stake here. Well said. Well, thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the world of brain-computer interfaces and remote neural monitoring. Yeah, it's been a really interesting conversation. It has. Until next time, everyone, keep those brains buzzing. And that's it for the deep dive. We'll see you next time.